All right, I think we're going to roll into another poll as we tee up this second panel or this first panel, second uh, session here. And uh, the poll is, let me roll back to it. Are you familiar with CISA's role in election security? Yes. Well, of course, you're going to vote yes, because uh, you are now. Uh, were you familiar with CISA's role in election security uh, is a question that we want to ask. And as we're teeing that up, let me tee up this next superpower panel. All right, uh, we talked a moment ago about um, the agenda, and we are talking about cybersecurity maturity model certification, CMMC. Many of you may have heard it, uh, some of you probably haven't, but that's okay because Jeff Dalton is one of the board members and he is going to give us the 101 and sort of what's going on internally in regards to the CMMMC activity. Dr. Phyllis Schneck, who interesting enough, prior to her being the CISO at Northrop, actually worked at MPPD, was front and center, right smack in the middle of this election security in 2016. John Weiler, Managing Director, IT Acquisition Advisory Council, and Chairman of the Board for CMMC Center of Excellence, and Robert Morgus, Senior Director at Cyberspace Solarium Commission, who is going to be uh, telling us a little bit about the future of CMMC. Phyllis is going to get into sort of, you know, what does it look like from a defense industrial base, very large uh, defense integrator, working with a lot of suppliers. And uh, John is going to lend his expertise in regards to just sort of the state of the state and talk about what the Center of Excellence does. So with that, let's make sure we have all these folks online with us here. I think we do. Uh, all right, here we go on the uh, CISA poll. Uh, were you familiar with CISA's role in election security? Looks like uh, about 41% of you said yes. Some, somewhat, a lot said no, and that's good to know that because now you do know a lot of extensive activity uh, that goes on with uh, um, uh, the CISA folks, particularly in the role that uh, that they're playing now in regards to election security, and certainly uh, prior to that, uh, back in 2016, and all the midterm elections uh, that were going on at the time. All right, well, so we are going to start with Mr. Dalton, who again, board member, CMMC, accrediting body. Uh, Jeff, can you give us the 101 first on what this body is, and then tell us what's, uh, what's the state of the state these days? Absolutely, and good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for attending. Uh, great to see uh, my old friend, John Weiler, and, and others. And Luke, thank you for, for having me. Uh, I'll just be presenting a couple of slides and talking a little bit about the current state of CMMC. And I think uh, you're operating the slides so we can go to the next one. So uh, obviously CMMC is a hot topic. A lot of people are talking about it. And, and someone asked me the other day, what, what's the best thing about CMMC? And, there's an awful lot of components uh, in this program, but to me, the best thing is that everybody's talking about cybersecurity for the first time in, in years. Uh, I, I hear a lot of CISOs talk about how they can't get senior management's attention. Well, they're getting it now, and that's excellent. The amount of uh, interactions going on in the public, in the media, on social media, and everywhere else um, has been all cyber all the time, which is absolutely important that we do that. And to me, that's the greatest thing about CMMC. But generally, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's a third party assessment process. Um, some people have said, well, it's, you know, it's got a lot of NIST 800-171 in it. Yes, that's true. And it has some additional things in it. But the, the big difference between that and other uh, models that are being used on the market today is that this is a third party assessment that's going to be conducted by a certified assessor, which as you all know, is very different than self-assessment. So let's go to the next slide. So why do we need, uh, why do we need something like CMMC? Um, and, and I think uh, Katie Arrington's quote here is, is pretty appropriate. Um, and I've heard her say this in a lot of different ways, but 
that's the essence is is if we were all doing it right, we wouldn't need a model, we wouldn't need third party assessments. Uh, we've been signing off on on NIST 800 self assessments for a long time now, but we still continue to have issues. And so now we're going to take it to the next level. We're going to say, hey, you're you're doing a lot of these things. Uh, you need to make sure you're consistent in the way you're doing them in order to protect national security. So this is why we have to do this. So go ahead. Um, I I was uh, I was shocked actually when I got involved uh, with the CMMC back in in January. Uh, the extent to which uh, we have uh, problems with cybersecurity. I knew of course that we had a lot, and I'd read just like everybody else in the media of all the various breaches. But to the extent of which this was going on was really mind boggling for me. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And um, Kate. He gave a couple of really nice examples. Um, the amount of money being uh, something like $600 billion a year in intellectual property being stolen by adversaries. This is above and beyond what people are reading in the media. Uh, this is above and beyond Equifax and, you know, uh, Target getting breached. This is, this is military defense information and other information, healthcare information, banking information. These are things that are being, um, you know, picked by our adversaries, uh, seemingly uh, without as much effort as they, sh they should to get it. And um, it's really, uh, when you start getting into the numbers, it's, it's really important that we get focused on this. Go ahead to the next slide. There's a great example of, of why, um, and this is another example I, I borrowed from Katie. Um, if you take a look at the uh, the Chengdu J20 and the F35, you'll see that remarkably and coincidentally, they look awfully similar and perform awfully similar. Um, and yes, in fact, that design was pilfered from US systems. And um, if that's not enough of a reason, I don't know what the total dollar amount of that program was, but of course, it, in the billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, is now uh, taken for free by one of our at least uh, competitors, if, if not adversaries, and um, depending on your perspective, I guess. Uh, but see, something has to be done. Something more than what we're doing has to be done. So that was the birth of the CMMC, where the DOD said, we have to take action here. And and that's that's how it started. So go ahead, next slide, please. So I'd have to say that uh, you know my own journey uh, with the CMMC has been really interesting. Um, this is of course uh, a startup organization. The accreditation body is a startup, and the product that this startup is is building and delivering is the assessment uh, ecosystem. So the CMMC is a framework. Um, I don't really like to call it an audit model. It's a framework that um, defines five levels of cybersecurity, starting with what they call basic cyber hygiene, moving up to the most advanced level, level five. And you'll you'll see some similarities to some other models in the industry. So there's uh, a certain degree of uh, comfort with some people because they recognize the five levels and they recognize the fact that each level is um, adds on to the next level before it. So it, it provides uh, companies with sort of an evolutionary path to starting out. A lot of these small companies in the DIB may not have any formal cybersecurity programs, and it's an evolutionary path. They can start with level one, then they can move to level two, and ultimately level three probably for most, and then with a lot of the bigs, uh, probably level four and five at some point in the future. So go ahead, next slide, please. So one of the really interesting things about this model uh, as compared to what we're used to seeing is this notion of maturity. And you'll look on the left-hand side, you'll see that you know, at level one, companies are just doing whatever they can to provide cybersecurity for their organization. But as they move up through the levels, they demonstrate organizational maturity. And what is organizational maturity? Um, a lot of, that's probably the number one question I get because people are saying, yeah, I understand NIST, but I don't really understand this organizational maturity requirement. And what it's about is, is the culture. Does the culture demonstrate, the culture of an organization, does it demonstrate 
um, consistent cyber practices. Um, not that you do something once, not that you do something twice, but it's the normal way of doing business. And there are practices in the CMC model that address um, how well the culture has adapted to this new model, this new idea of constant cybersecurity vigilance. So that will be part of the assessment, uh, making sure that this people are properly trained, making sure that things are properly documented, making sure that they've been in existence for, um, you know, some at, at least short period of time in some cases, and sometimes longer periods of time. Um, so there are definitely going to be a view of maturity in this model versus other models like you might see like in NIST or in um, ISO 20, uh, 27001, where it's a little bit more of a yes or no sort of a model. So next slide, please. So there's five levels of uh, not only practices, uh, which each add to the capabilities of the controls that you're implementing, but also five levels of maturity, leading all the way up from starting with uh, what they call performed, which is, you know, you're just you're doing your regular job, you're doing the best you can do, but there really isn't a program in place. And you see this a lot with a lot of small companies, uh, especially startup companies. Uh, moving up through, we have a documented process, we check on that process, we're consistently improving that process, um, and we're we're really mastering this notion of cybersecurity vigilance uh, all the way up to level five. So that is how you, uh, the companies are going to be evaluated within the context of these levels. Now, the, the DOD is, is telling us that the vast majority of assessments will be at either the level one or the level three area. But since they haven't started yet, uh, we don't know exactly what those numbers are going to look like. But level three will be a, a, a typical level for a prime or somebody that is a decent sized company. And level one will be a typical level for a very small supplier, maybe a sub of, of some kind and yet to be determined what those numbers are. So next slide, please. The big differentiator for level three, of course, we most of us probably know is that if the company handles CUI, then you know, controlled and classified information, then you will by definition have to be level three. If you don't handle CUI, then by definition, you will not have to be level three. Um, so back in, uh, I guess, maybe October of last year, so about a year ago, um, the DOD chartered uh, the CMMC AB, the accreditation body. And they asked the accreditation body, which currently is a set of volunteers who make up their board to put together the CMMC ecosystem. So the ecosystem's got a lot of components to it. Um, it isn't just a matter of getting some assessors and putting them in the field. Uh, we, we have to have a pipeline of assessors because with close to 300,000 companies in the DIB, um, you just don't find you know assessors sitting around with nothing to do. You have to uh, build a pipeline, you've got to build a career path, you've got to have training, you've got to have examinations, you have to have assessment methods and assessment guides in order to create a consistent experience for all of the DIB companies. It isn't just a matter of saying, go take this model and go out and talk to these companies. There has to be a rules of evidence and evidence sufficiency and all kinds of different things that are behind the science of conducting assessments. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough um, to not only be working with some really fabulous people, but also um, uh, to lead the credentialing committee where I get to have fun with things like evidence sufficiency and and uh, and rules of evidence and things like that, which is something I'm pretty passionate about. So go ahead in the next slide. So just a couple of uh, points, just because I get these questions a lot and I wanna make things clear. Um, the AB is an independent corporation um, with an all-volunteer board. Yes, the AB will be staffed once assessments get underway with professionals, but at this point in time, the AB is made up of volunteers, and we estimate um, between the 15 volunteers, well, about 12 volunteers right now, uh, we've put in close to 10,000 hours since January 1st of time to put this together. I know I've probably done about uh, 
1200 myself and I know some other folks have done more than that. Um, the directors are from all across the industry. So we have some directors from some of the bigs, we have directors from small businesses, we have directors from academia. So it's, it's a really nice diverse um, group of folks that bring all kinds of different things to the table, but these people are not representing their companies. So no one on the board um, has, uh, is able to be uh, conducting assessments or conducting a training themselves or become C3POs or become assessors. Uh, that is precluded in our code of professional conduct and our non-compete. So no one is representing their own company when, when, we bring, uh, when we bring our game to the board meetings and to all the work we do, we do it as members of the board that are trying to do their best to make national security a priority. Our our focus is to oper operationalize training, examination, and assessments, but there's all kinds of things in the ecosystem to support that. So go ahead to the next slide. Just about done. So I'm not gonna go through this in detail. We can probably talk a little bit to it, but like I said before, when I, you know, I have an assessment background about 20 years of doing as a professional assessor myself, I've led assessments on more than 300 large companies. You don't just throw an assessor out in the market and say, go assess. You have to have an ecosystem to support them. Assessments have to be consistent from company to company. They have to be credible. They have to have rules. They have to have QA. Um, they have to have sufficient evidence. Uh, there's all kinds of things that have to be in place. And we've identified a number of roles to build that pipeline of what looks like it'll be close to 3,000 assessors by 2026. Um, that means we need to have hundreds of, of um, you know, trainers and exam writers and, and QA people to support all of those assessments going on because we're talking about something in the neighborhood of 50,000 assessments a year once we get underway. And we'll, of course, we'll ramp up to that. The DOD has a walk-run strategy, which I think is right. Um, we are going to be doing a smaller number this year, and then we'll be ramping up dramatically every single year. So an ecosystem like this is absolutely critical. And sometimes people call me and they go, Jeff, why is there so many roles on this? And I'm like, the number 300,000 is the reason that this is defined the way it is. Um, if I was doing 100 assessments a year, I would, of course, have a very much simpler word chart. So go ahead, next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Obviously, a lot of you work for companies that may be interested in or may be required or interested to be assessed in, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, we understand with the interim rule that uh, RFIs with assessment requirements will start coming out maybe at the very end of the year, or earlier in 2021. So you will work with uh, what we're calling a certified or a CMMC third-party assessment organization C3PAO, uh, and you'll contact them and have assessment schedules starting next year sometime. Um, so you will get to interact with a lot of the roles that I just described and a lot of the processes I've talked about. And I am always here and, and thankful to have been part of this exercise. And with that, I think uh, I'm all done. So thanks very much, Luke. Jeff, thanks a whole lot. We're going to hold the questions until the end for all the panel members. And I really do appreciate you sort of highlighting you know it started with uh you know espionage back in the day you know pre-world war ii right and then world war ii the b-29 right the atom bomb uh and now a lot of corporate espionage so you think about all that all the way up to you know uh you know is the uh the integrity and the intellectual property of these vaccines and uh you know the things that are going on there safe uh so really important uh, and a lot of that is software based too i might add We've gone way beyond guards, gates, and locks, and I really do appreciate the 101 plus plus on the CMMC. Well, let me introduce Dr. Phyllis Schneck. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, uh, Phyllis had the opportunity uh, during the OPM breach uh, to recognize that this, uh, I'll call it the industrial base, it wasn't the defense industrial base per se, I guess it was actually, but uh, the point there is uh, as we start to look at some of these tertiary, you know, collateral systems, we recognize, hmm, boy, we got some work to do there. And a lot of times the vulnerability 
uh, in this sort of ecosystem is with not just the core systems, but these collateral systems. And she very quickly became an expert on that, already was an expert, and made us all an expert. Uh, Phyllis, take it away in regards to now working for Northrop Grumman Base. Northrop Grumman, a huge industrial base, defense industrial base vendor that's got lots and lots of, probably thousands of suppliers that she has to deal with on this topic. Uh, thank you. Good morning, and Luke, you're so kind. Thank you for the introduction. It's nice to talk to you again, and thank you for all the work that you did as, as a CIO or at the department when I was a deputy under at NPPD. Um, I really want to thank the consortium for uh, information and software quality. It's, it's so important to acknowledge that the systems we build and the infrastructure that we work on is so vulnerable and the more that we can put these consistent standards and attention and partnership to them the more secure they are for our country uh, i also want to do a, a shout out thank you to bill of CISQ and also of course um, to our government partners and, and katie errington whose name you've already heard this morning uh, who's just been such a champion not only for the effort but for truly as was said before by jeff changing the culture and what we're doing with the cybersecurity maturity model certification or the cmmc really is that and saying how is it that we as industry that work with this very sensitive data sensitive but unclassified so uh, this controlled unclassified information that we call cooey how are we handling that not only as the big primes but all the way through the supply chain and so about a year ago one year ago tomorrow i started at north Grumman. And one of the first realizations that came to me was uh, the phenomenal team, not only in our company at Northrop Grumman, but within the greater defense industrial base and the partnership we all have together um, with our government, with our customers, with our suppliers to truly uh, infuse a culture of security throughout our systems. And so very quickly, go to the next slide. I just have some quick bullets, but I'll, I'll talk through those. Uh, we are, uh, with our partners, founding members of the task forces of the actual defense industrial base itself that I recall in a, in a past life when that was formed. Uh, the coordinating council that comes from the constructs uh, in, in what was NPVD and now CISA uh, that really help public and private talk to each other in the right construct so that we can truly share not just information but meaningful information be beyond the indicators. Uh, we've been active as a company and as a community in leading the task forces that are dedicated to truly working with our government partners, our suppliers, and those that, that really stand to put a lot of knowledge and intellectual capital into truly making this work. Um, I shout out Bob Kalaski to all of your work. You know, when I met you and I came to DHS, you were leading um, the work group that made uh, a lot of the implementation for the cybersecurity framework that has been an absolute standard and, and uh, a way of doing business for most of our private sector. And this CMMC is one of those moments, again, just like the cyber framework was, uh, this is another time when we'll start infusing a new culture. So uh, next slide. As we build on this and um, as a community build in some of the best practices, uh, you look at why, why are we doing this? And it really is to lock down these systems and secure them from adversaries. But that really takes when you drill into that. It's a people, culture, process, and technology effort. And as Jeff mentioned, that, that third party assessment, that's key. It gives you consistency, it gives you confidence in the process. My thanks, uh, huge thanks uh, to that accreditation board. Um, the hard work that's done by volunteers um, to make something like this happen with the level of integrity that this group is doing, it's phenomenal and it's hard. Uh, when we look at where we're going to go with the maturity, the levels were mentioned earlier, the consistency is so important there. When you say a level three, a level three in a big company has to mean the same thing as a level three in a small company. As we know, about 90% of the business infrastructure in this country is small and medium businesses. And companies like Northrop Grumman and the big primes have tens of thousands of suppliers. And we want to work with these companies in this partnership community, the DIB community, with the government to make sure that those smaller companies are at the same level of security as we are. Even though we can afford big teams and a lot of technology, a level three in one company, has to be a level three in another. So really that roadmap is, is critical. 
that consistency is critical and that comes from working day to day with each other, with our partners to design this. We want to make sure that as we grow, the word maturity doesn't mean you stop here. It means I'm constantly watching the new technology, the new process, and what the adversary wants. They want everything we are, learn, and know. You saw the pictures of the, the flying product a few minutes ago, uh, tip of the iceberg, and we want to make sure that as we get new technology, we are constantly making sure it's resilient. It goes to the point of this whole conference. And so that changing culture and how we handle that controlled unclassified information, that CUI, and how at every step in our company and others, we know where that information is, we know the products in which it's allowed to sit, we know how it transits, we know where it's in re at rest. Uh, OPM was mentioned earlier. One of the huge lessons I think the government learned from that is encryption at rest. Know where your high value assets are and, and protect them. And we want to make sure all of this is drives business, helps drive business. So when you think about what are the advantages, uh, smaller companies don't have to do as much reporting and constant management. It should become muscle memory if we get this right. And that's why we've been working so hard as a community. And it's one of the things in the past year that I've been at, at Northrop Grumman and realizing what a community we are with all the other big crimes and, and with our government partners and with our partners that are building the CMMC, um, I can't stress enough how critical it is because it takes everybody on board to do this, both from the information sharing as well as the design of the program. Um, Katie and her team have put so much time into making sure that these processes will be uh, consistent, that they'll be effective. Uh, we have long conversations with all the companies together about what is reasonable, what helps us drive a more secure business. So with that, next slide. Um, when we think about how we're going to help all those tens of thousands of suppliers, we've gotten together as the defense industrial base and created some resources so that literally there's a great website called Cyber Assist and, and some key people on my team have taken lead on this with the rest of the DIB, the Cyber Assist website. This is a, a big recommendation I would make if you have this, um, look at the resources there. They've been compiled over uh, the past year and a little more looking at how, if you're a small and medium supplier, what are the things out there that will help you implement this? What are the gotchas? What are the best practices? What are the things that you can start to do? And where are the people that, that can help you? So a lot of these resources are out there, both from us and the government. We're working with the government right now on sort of an in English guide, if you will, the cliff notes to CMMC and some of the upcoming uh, additional regulations to make sure that it's understandable, because this is uh, the technical term I would use. This is really good stuff. And this really helps, uh, again, the supply chain get in line with how to truly change a culture, because that's that will be the challenge for the adversary when it's harder for them to find a hole, because overall we are following best practices. Uh, so very quickly, next slide. Um, when you uh, are online, if you want to go and look at, at the demo, go ahead and log on to the Cyber Assist website. Each of these little bullets, they've all been designed with a lot of discussion uh, and in partnership with the entire DIV, uh, with many, many people and with the government. Uh, this is user friendly and I can't suggest it enough. I have given this smaller suppliers have asked me where can I go over the past few months to look at things for CMMC as it rolls out. Uh, how do I get started with this? What are the things I have to do? What does it mean to have an assessment? It is actually all here. And so next slide. Um, and we just have again a demo. We can't do this live for you, although I'd like to. Um, but really it does show you what are the things that are required of you? How do we apply the standards? And how do we make sure that, uh, again, our smaller suppliers that don't have hundreds of people dedicated to this, how do we make sure that you follow the same levels of consistency. It's so important, not only to enable those companies, but to really boost the integrity and the quality of the materials that we are developing, and then to make sure that we protect that product together. So very quickly, next. Um, so what's coming next? I can tell you that as a DIV, as a defense industrial base, we all, all our companies talk uh, probably more than once a week together. We talk about that frequently uh, with the government, and we're looking at 
what are the things that as we begin to roll this out and there there have been some initial projects of course already to understand it but how do you get prepared what are the baseline assessments and again not just for a big company because we have a lot of people that can understand this we do this all the time all kinds of regulations and all kinds of programs, but those smaller suppliers that are focused on building a unique piece of something that we in the country need that are not necessarily designed to put hundreds of people towards cybersecurity. How do we help them? And it's so important that they thrive as well. So again, back to the great work of the accreditation board, making sure that we have good assessors, making sure those third party assessments are not only consistent, but it's a big deal. Hey, you get a certain score on an assessment. It either shows you what you can, can where you can improve, or it's something you can write about. And it really is showing cybersecurity as an enabler. We can actually look at if you've already done certain levels of assessment, which many of the big crime, all the big crimes have done these for the government for years. You get the reciprocity, the things you're already doing and already in line with they count, so you don't have to get reassessed on those things. And there are very robust efforts to ensure that the, the investment of time, intellectual capital we've already put in there, it counts. And what we're really looking to do is help people improve their cybersecurity. And the maturity piece of that, it's an optimization at the very top levels. And it really focuses on, instead of perfection, improvement and continuous driving with new technologies are you at a level where your organization has actually changed a culture where it's in your muscle memory that that controlled unclassified information is watched and cared for from the smallest supplier to the deliverer of the fighter jet? And that's what's going to change and is changing how we work as a community. And that's going to scare the adversary, which we love. The next. Yeah. All so right, I'm Phyllis. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So much, and uh, we're, we're going to hold on these questions. I know we have a lot of them. That was awesome, right? I mean, you said it uh, and described it so eloquently, right? I mean, this is not easy stuff. Thousands and thousands of suppliers, from the little ones all the way up to the ones building these massive integrated weapon systems, right? And uh, and look, when you take on something this daunting, there's going to be some forming, storming, norming performing right i mean that's just a reality of this uh, this is not easy to do but ultimately we want to make sure an apple is an apple is an apple and is, is an apple all the way across this defense industrial base we really do appreciate it uh, before we uh, introduce our next panel member we're going to throw another poll out there this is poll number three in your organization preparing for cmmc certification excuse me in your organization select one of these uh you can only pick one uh that's your uh that's your uh, sort of rating yourself at are you preparing for the cmmc certification preparing to conduct cmmc oh. assessments number three preparing to put cmmc requirements into contracts or looking at it or developing standards for cmmc uh with hey, that Luke. we're going to collect those uh excuse me <laughs> I'm sorry, it's Tracy. We have a little technical difficulty with that poll, so it, it no actually had problem. closed out. That, that come is out. okay. Uh, well, with that, then we're gonna we're gonna hold on that poll and let me roll on to panel number number three, John Weiler. For those that may not know, John, one of the most passionate folks I know in regards to uh, this subject matter and uh, just uh, acquisition in general. And uh, John is uh, running the uh, CMMC Center of Excellence, and is going to take a few minutes to describe what that is and sort of how that fits into the ecosystem. John, you're on. Well, thank you very much, Luke. It's been a while. I love to see you stay engaged, Phyllis. Great presentation, and uh, it was really nice to see my uh, colleague Jeff Dalton again. Uh, we've worked together hand in hand setting up the CMMC AB for the last year. Uh, just about a month and a half ago, uh, I was uh, running what was called the strategic relations group for the CMMCAB. And it was pretty clear uh, when attempting to forge alliances with various standards bodies, other communities of practice, DIB communities, and reach out to my colleagues in the EU, ANISA, uh, NATO, and UK MOD, 
that there was a larger ecosystem that needed to be brought together. So I signed uh, the ITAC, uh, executed an MOU with the EAB to say, let us help uh, organize these partners in a way outside of the EAB's ability. As a 501c3, uh, you don't have members. And uh, we used the IT Acquisition Advisory Council 501c6 structure to then build into the new organization called the Center of Excellence, CMMC COE. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to skip through this. Jeff Dalton did a great job. Uh, I, I think we already have it pretty clear that uh, the CMMC is an extension of NIST 171, and 171 is an extension of NIST 800-53. Next slide, please. And. Uh, Jeff did a good job on this one as well. You know, as you move up the organization, it requires more expertise, more controls, and more understanding of what this cyber resilience is going to require under this new audit program. What's also interesting, as you do move up to level five, the level of technical acumen increases, especially for those that have uh, complex large organizations, an understanding of how to store their CY and FCI data and what are the proper technical mechanisms is not fully flushed out in the CMMC standard. Next, please. Um, uh, again, this is uh, covered a little bit, but it, it might not have given proper uh, recognition to the role of John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and Carnegie Mellon CERT, SEI CERT, who have actually partnered up with the a, uh, OUSD ANS to build out the 171 framework into levels of maturity. And it's really interesting as we, we look at the overlapping and interconnected tissue of CMMC with other standards, that there are efforts to understand how does CMMC align or uh, uh, connect with things like FedRAMP and cloud security and supply chain risk management. So there are other adjacent and uh, important cybersecurity issues and standards that may not be covered by CMMC, which is part of the reason why the COE exists is to help organizations who are trying to comply, trying to get prepared, is to have a place to go to go beyond just getting certified is to understand the whole ecosystem of cybersecurity. So our scope and our interests are much larger than the CMMC standard by itself. Next slide, please. So uh, again, Jeff did a great job. I, we use some of the same materials uh, about you know, why this is critical. Yes, the, uh, our enemies and those who do not uh, respect our intellectual property are stealing it and because we have not secured our systems. The self assertion has not worked. And we do need to push the defense industrial base and other communities who are adopting CMMC. Uh, we are talking with NASA now, who has asked us to help stand up a training program for their contractors. We're coordinating with uh, GSA. We reached out to the State Department. And in fact, we've opened up an office in London already to support our colleagues and dip suppliers in the uh, UK and uh, in ESA. Next, please. So the COE mission is to be an enabler to help uh, contractors, large and small, understand what they need to do and to have a collaboratory where there's a central source to understand all the relevant things they need to consume from a knowledge point of view, from a templates point of view, from a related standards point of view, to have one place to go and, and get help in preparing for the audit. You don't wanna jump into an audit unless you know that you're likely to meet those requirements and get properly certified. So the, the cost of preparation is estimated to be several times larger than the, or 10 times larger, than the cost of actually going through the audit in itself. So the CMMC COE, is designed to be that force multiplier, to work in the public interest, to allow multitude of organizations, uh, communities of practice, standards bodies, and technology companies to help one another to create an ecosystem that supports and accelerates this uh, cyber hygiene, resilience, and compliance. Next slide, please. 
Um, so our vision again is not just focused on certification. It, the, uh, the purpose is to really look at the larger ecosystem and to bring in real best practices and things that we've already discovered of how do I get there? And we believe that organizations that have already gone through this process, the largest, you know, might want to help <laughs> get their small business suppliers, their medium suppliers, their tech suppliers to get on board. And it's going to be really difficult because you have a, a many to many situation with many small businesses supporting many large contractors. So how do you enable those? How do you give them a place where they can accelerate their own uh, cyber hygiene and understand what platforms are viable, affordable, and can protect the data? You know, down the road, we do uh, expect some mechanisms by which uh, those who have been approaching us in the um, uh, the cloud security world saying, hey, can you help create a domain by which small businesses come in and store their data at a reasonable cost and help them understand how to manipulate those 400 controls? Because they don't have that expertise today. And we can't afford to wipe out three, 400,000 contractors who just aren't ready and don't have the expertise to get there. So this will be a critical tool for helping them get ready and work in partnership with my colleagues over at the AB. Next slide, please. So, you know, here's a, a you know a couple bullet points of where we're at. You know, we, we launched this uh, a couple months ago. Uh, we're delighted that uh, we have brought in some uh, great organizations to be part of this. Uh, CompTIA joined early. They're a training organization in cyber. We're, you know, enabling them to deliver CMMC training and mentoring as well. Uh, we have uh, signed a relationship with Professional Services Council to bring their community to bear to help them get ready and prepared. Uh, we have set up a, a strategic partnership with the European Union's largest cybersecurity accreditation board over there. It's called Crest Approved. We are helping bring that expertise into the U.S. domain. They've already signed agreements with Cyber Command and NSA, and in, re in return, we're hoping to help them expand into the CMMC uh, world for the European Union, ANISA, NATO allies, et cetera. Um, uh, my colleagues over at the EAB, you know, they have a heavy lift. Uh, we expect to be a, a complementary role to them but through the MOU that we signed with the ITAC and continue to operate as an honest broker to sort through all the complex issues of technology standards, emerging technologies that are coming down the pike and map those into uh, those who are consumers of that capability, both in government and industry. Next slide, please. So here's a bit of how this partnerships and alliances works. Again, as a 501c6, you know, our primary intention is to partner up with leading nonprofits, standards bodies, and IT communities of interest to empower their communities to bring in training and mentoring, to facilitate in the knowledge sharing of how do you get there, how do you get secure, what platforms do I use? So there, there's a lot of reuse that we expect. We have already stood up a knowledge base. We have six working groups that we've already put together and we're open to, uh, for business. So we welcome those who care about this community to work together for the common good. Thank you so much. I'm done with this. Jim, thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. And I appreciate you sort of, uh, sort of knitting this ecosystem together if you were uh, as we talked um, uh, this is not easy stuff this is all hands on deck another important element of this is the cyber space solarium commission and uh, Robert Mag Magnus is going to tell us sort of the you know sort of paint a picture of the future of CMMC when we sort of get to uh, down the road a year or so year plus uh, what does this look like what's sort of the vision what's the intent what can we expect as we're starting to uh, uh, realize the uh, the dream, so to speak, of, of putting this massive effort together? Robert, you're on. Thanks, Luke. Uh, as, as Luke mentioned, my name is Rob Morgus. I'm a senior director with the commission. Um, I want to do a few things. I want to talk briefly, introduce everyone who's online to the commission itself because we're a relatively new organization. Not everyone knows about us. So say a few words about that. 
uh, talk about what the commission saw in terms of the CMMC and what we didn't look into in terms of the CMMC, and then talk a little bit about where the CMMC fits into the broader ecosystem of confidence mechanisms and what that can tell us about how the CMMC can evolve moving forward. Um, so in terms of the commission, uh, we are a congressionally mandated executive branch commission uh, that was authorized by the 2019 fiscal year 2019 National Defense Authorization Act. Um, the President and Congress tasked the Commission with essentially two major tasks. First, uh, to develop a strategic approach that will defend the United States, not just the United States government, but the United States uh, against cyber attacks of significant consequences. And second, to prescribe policies and legislation that would be required to implement that strategy that was developed by the Commission. Uh, we worked throughout 2019 and early 2020, uh, and that's important for a couple of reasons I'll get into in a second. Uh, and published our final report in March of 2020, uh, which was released in two sections, the strategic approach and then the recommendations, which were the policy prescriptions and the legislative proposals to implement the strategic approach. Uh, our strategy and goals, our, our strategy in short was one of essentially layered cyber deterrence, which it emphasizes national resiliency, public-private collaboration, the importance of a secure ecosystem, which we heard Phyllis, John and Jeff already talk about. Uh, our short-term goal was to prevent or mitigate the effects of cyber attacks of significant consequence. And our long-term goal is to create a digital environment or an ecosystem that is safe, stable, promotes the continued innovation and economic growth and protects personal privacy and ensures national security. Um, the layers of our, of our approach are, are pretty simple. First, uh, the commission set out to prescribe policies and recommendations that would shape behavior of adversaries, working with allies and partners to encourage restraint and promote responsible behavior in cyberspace. Second, deny benefits, and this is where resiliency and a secure ecosystem come into play. And third, impose costs, and that's where we get into things like defend forward and persistent engagement. Um, we organized our thoughts around three or six pillars uh, within these sort of lines of effort. Uh, we need to reform the U.S. government structures to better handle cybersecurity. Uh, we need to improve our capacity to defend forward and engage persistently. That involves uh, improving DOD capability. Um, we need to build better resiliency. Uh, we need to engage better internationally. We need to build a more resilient cyber ecosystem, and we need to create meaningful public-private collaboration uh, between the U.S. government and the private sector. Uh, and you could extend that out to state and local governments as well. Um, within those pillars, obviously, I mentioned ecosystem. Uh, the commission, because of our timeline, uh, doing most of our work in late 2019 and early 2020, the CMMC was still in a very nascent stage. In fact. By the time we had uh, really finished our text of our final report, which formed the basis for most of our strategy, the CMMC hadn't been released publicly yet. Uh, so we looked at it, but we decided it's not our place to necessarily, necessarily comment on it. Uh, but as the CMMC evolved and our work evolved over the last sort of six to eight months, uh, we began to see some parallels between what the CMMC is trying to achieve and some of the recommendations that the commission proposed. And this is all basically around this notion of confidence mechanisms, third-party assessments. Um, we think the CMMC gets at two critical challenges that the commission also identified. The first is around improving the behavior, the cybersecurity behavior of organizations. And the second is critical, and it's this notion of helping procurement and acquisition folks better understand what they're buying or contracting, right? That's sort of the bread and butter of the CMMC. I think Phyllis talked about uh, sort of improving the ecosystem as a whole. I think she talked about people, process, and technology. The commission took a very similar approach, and I think the CMMC embodies this approach, and that is the, the, the notion that the ecosystem is not just technology. That's a core component, but organizations or processes and people also plug into that ecosystem uh, and represent potential vulnerabilities. Um, the question is, how do you scale security across all of those? Uh, one of the ideas that the commission puts forward is the notion of a certification, uh, which is one of the key uh, mechanisms for ensuring confidence on a buyer, from a buyer's perspective. Um, and I think, I think every single one of the panelists uh, made the point that self-attestation to this point has not worked very well, uh, and it's time for third-party assessment. The commission agreed with that not just looking at the DOD acquisition space, but looking at the broader ecosystem where we're talking about critical infrastructure providers, where we're talking about state and local government, where we're talking about civilian government acquisition and procurement. Um, Self-attestation is not making us more secure from a technology perspective and from a contractor perspective. Uh, it's time for third-party assessments. Um, well, the, well, the commission didn't consciously include federal government cybersecurity in, or consciously actually did not include federal government cybersecurity within its mandate. It wasn't really part of our remit. 
uh, we think that a couple of our recommendations are particularly relevant to this conversation. Um, basically, while agreed upon security standards and best practices are useful in reducing vulnerability in information technology systems, they can be a little bit difficult uh, for procurement officers, for acquisitions officers to wade through. Uh, what's needed, therefore, uh, from our perspective, to help folks better differentiate product based on security, whether it's IT product or contracting product, uh, is a clearer and easier to understand set of information in the marketplace. That's where things like CMMC and uh, broader certification regimes come into play. Um, the most relevant recommendation that the commission came up with, and I think this can provide good guidance for uh, CMMC as it moves forward, is this concept of a national cybersecurity certification and labeling authority. Um, the challenge was basically, uh, as I set out, without accessible and transparent mechanisms to understand and compare security between products or contractors for that matter, critical infrastructure owners and operators, government procurement officers, you know, one and the same, cannot easily price security into their purchasing decisions. I think that's one of the things that CMMC will help, in particular, uh, government acquisition officers better understand when, when they're buying better security or when they're engaging with better security in the marketplace. The goal for the National Cybersecurity Certification and Labeling Authority, which is a mouthful, uh, but is the commission's recommendation, um, is to create more and more digestible information in the market for hardware and software, as well as services, giving purchasers more and better information to help them make more educated purchasing decisions. Uh, the goal here, like I said, is to provide consumers, including everyday people in our case, though uh, I think the CMMC is, is clearly more tailored, with uh, better information about security and the products that they buy. We recognize the need to, the need to nudge markets rather than necessarily uh, place top-down constraints and regulations on markets uh, in the right direction in some cases, but we're leery of heavy-handed approaches, like I said. Uh, NICLA would be a government-funded nonprofit organization that would essentially serve as a project manager for certification and labeling programs. So you would have different verticals, whether it's, for example, DOD procurement being one of those verticals, but also something like smart, smart home devices being different verticals. National Cybersecurity Certification Labeling Authority would run a, pro a program that helps harmonize across all of those different things. Um, NICLA would be empowered to accredit certifying agents uh, like potentially the, the AB, uh, and would work to identify standards and benchmarks against which certification can be judged with those uh, accredited certifying agents. The ideal end state for this recommendation is a robust market and ecosystem for clearly defined and communicated certifications and labels that help consumers or acquisitions and procurement officers uh, more easily price security into their purchasing decisions. The, the commission's contention is that our with the right information, folks will make these decisions and we'll see the market move towards demanding greater security from IT, from services, from goods. And a few key points here uh, about confidence mechanisms generally, and I think this is relevant to the CMMC as it moves forward, just relevant to the National Cybersecurity Certification Labeling Authority as it, as it potentially unfolds. Uh, first, and I think this was already touched on, when we talk about confidence mechanisms, they need to be tied to existing standards and best practices. That includes not just things like the NIST standards that we've already mentioned, but also standards and best practices internationally. We are participating in the global marketplace. If we go our own direction on this, we run into potential interoperability challenges with allies. Uh, we create more costs for the businesses that are supplying for us because they have to make one for us and one for everyone else. It's not a good situation to be in. The second big point is that when we talk about confidence mechanisms, they need to be objective and measurable. What does that mean? It means, are you compliant or not? And can we measure whether you are compliant or not with the standard best practice? Mushy standards, mushy best practices where you can say, ah, yeah, we're kind of compliant. Don't really do anyone any good. We need yes or no answers there. Um, the final piece, and Phyllis in particular talked about this, is uh, we hold very strongly that when we talk about confidence mechanisms and certifications in particular, uh, there needs to be flexible op options for conformity. So if you are compliant with standard X that says Y, but standard Z also says Y, if you're compliant with either X or Z, you should be compliant with the overarching standard. Um, so I'll leave it at that, uh, and I look forward to a good conversation. Thanks, Luke. I really do appreciate that and a uh, lot of uh, good thinking going on there. And, and again, very super complex uh, uh, set of activities here as we kind of embark into this um, uh, journey as a community, so to speak. A lot of good questions out here. Let me throw a couple of them out here for hey, the hey, panel. Luke, uh, 
Yes. One thing I just would like to add, you know, as we open up these European operations, we are finding the exact things that Robert brought to bear about how to resynchronize what's going on in our NATO allies along with what's happening with the AB certification process. We need some mechanisms to work within the European domain and uh, we're not extending our operations into that well today. It's, it's, there are some complexities there that have to be addressed. Yeah, some early movement activity there that uh, that needs to be dealt with as again, as we light this thing up, right? I would say that we're in the, uh, 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 you know, maybe out of storming uh, into forming. Uh, let me throw the first question out there. Somebody uh, picked right up on it said at the uh, Cyber Resilience Summit last year, Katie Arrington actually spoke. She mentioned uh, credible CMMC program applied to 300,000 entities would require, you know, 10 to 15,000 assessors. Jeff's number is currently much lower. Uh, the question is, you know, is that a change in the number of targets, scope of assessment change? You know, uh, Jeff, you want to speak to that? Sure. Yeah, and it's not a on change. That one? In... Yeah, and I know yeah sure. Absolutely. Required here, right? I'm sorry, say that again. I'm sorry, I was just saying perfection's not required here, oh, right? You know, yeah. as far as, that, again, we're, we're all learning and evolving, but uh, um, sure. thoughts on that, Jeff? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, no assessments have occurred yet, so it's hard to say exactly how long each one's gonna take. We've done some pilots, um, but you have to remember that if you said to me, you have to go out and assess 300,000 companies tomorrow, we probably would need that kind of number, but it's really a rolling number. So, you know, we won't, we will at least, it's not in our vision to assess 300,000 companies a year. Uh, we'll be assessing, you know, 50,000 companies a year or 40,000 companies a year. And those numbers aren't solid. I'm just kind of saying, my point sure. is, is that it's a rolling number. So yeah, there, there will be, I don't know how to say this, 10,000 uh, assessor man hours, person hours maybe out there, but we're not doing them all at the same time. So that number hasn't been established, but uh, you have to think about it more of a rolling number than, a, um, than an all at once number. Fair enough. And uh, I'll anticipate a question that will come in. You mentioned pilots. What, what are we learning from the pilots that have been done so far? Um, preparation is everything. So this is a really important, uh, important point. Um, we built into the assessment framework a, um, a lot of preparation. And at first, some people said, wow, that seems like a lot of upfront work. But really, it turns out that, you know, people think of the, the assessment or an audit uh, about like when the auditor is on site, they think of that as the audit. And having done this for a few decades, I think of that as the end of the audit, not the audit. The hard work goes into the preparation, understanding the context of what we're looking at, reviewing documents that are allowed to be reviewed prior to planning and scheduling, making sure we have all the right people. And I always tell my clients, it's kind of like a, a wedding where you do all this hard work and everybody gets you know stressed out and you do it all so that on the day of that event, you can just have a nice day and really enjoy it. And uh, audits and assessments should be the same way that the hard work goes up front. So that's one of the big lessons that I've learned is that the more um, preparation you are, the more prepared you are to actually conduct the event. I'm not talking about passing the event. I'm not talking about your cybersecurity profile. I'm talking about the actual assessment event itself requires preparation. You have to gather evidence. You have to identify people. You have to have conference rooms reserved. If it's not virtual, you have to have schedules set. You have to have a contract in place with a C3PAO. There's a lot of prep work. So we um, we learned almost immediately that problems or hiccups during the course of the uh, pilots were uh, because of preparation issues. So that's, a, sure. that's a something to really think about as we go into this. Prep is everything. Prep is everything. Okay. Got to make yeah. sure we're setting the table there. I see John smiling. He certainly did point that out there. Here's another question. I'm going to throw this one over to Robert. Um, has DOD published any reciprocity guidance between CMMC and other assessments, such as ISO 27, 
2001, DBIC, CAC, or others. Uh, you kind of touched on that sort of internationally. Have there been any that have been published, or is there any discussion about that right now that you're aware of? And, and certainly the other panel members can chime in as well. Unfortunately, Luke, uh, I'm not actually within DOD. I don't have great insight on that. I'm not okay. aware of any, um, but I think John and Jeff actually are probably in a better position to answer that. Sure. Thought maybe just yeah. sort of hearing noise out of the uh, out of the building, so to speak. So uh, let me throw it over to John. Any thoughts, John? Have you heard anything about that? There's been many discussions about reciprocity, and there's, uh, you know, some of this is being pushed out of the uh, CSP community. You know, I had a, I've already gone through a FedRAMP certification. Why does that not count for my CMMC level three? And as my colleagues, Jeff and others have said, well, frankly, it's apples and chainsaws. You know, one like FedRAMP and uh, the cloud certifications, uh, processes are looking at the availability of controls to meet a certain technical requirement. And as Jeff did a, uh, a succinct job of explaining, CMMC is more organizational uh, cyber resilience and maturity. So even though it does help enable, you can't say that one accounts for another. Uh, the same thing with some of these other standards that are out there. You're really going to have to look at, you know, those 171 controls and saying, what, you know, how far can this move you up the chain into that maturity model? And, and that's, it's a challenge. And we've been looking at this for over a year. And frankly, it, it can, the, the best thing I can say to those is if you've done that, then your preparatory process should be less painful because you're already dealing with these, but the auditor cannot accept the the risks of saying someone else's audit, someone else's certification accommodates you. That is a risk I don't think they're gonna be willing to take and neither will the AP. So does it help you? Yes. Is it going to prevent you from having to go through another audit? I don't think so. Mm, this is starting to sound like uh, FedRAMP to me. Um, we'll get Let into me, that. Uh, let me just address yeah, please, um, yeah. th there is definitely serious conversations going on about reciprocity and there are working groups working on it and our our colleagues at the uh, DOD have announced that there will be there will be some reciprocity now whether that's 100% of NIST 8171 or not or ISO 17021 um, what did I say that? 27,001, sorry. Um, there's so many ISO numbers flying around my head. Um, there will be. Now, John makes a great point that it isn't always one for one and you just can't assume. And, and my, my, um, you know, my observation on reciprocity has always been the maturity question, right? So we, we've got practices that are defined for evaluating. I loved, I loved the term Phyllis used. She said, uh, gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue now, but you used a great metaphor when you talked about, you know, maturity. Um, the other models don't ask for that. So how do you evaluate that? So that's going to be a really interesting component, but there will definitely be some level of reciprocity for those of you that have had, um, not self-assessments, but those of you that had external assessments done or audits. And a, lot, and a lot of the DIB has in some form or another, uh, Phyllis, you had talked about sort of culture, right? Um, and and uh, I'm going to throw this question over to you. Um, and just the sort of the scope of a CMMC audit from your perspective as to, you know, what's that going to look like uh, from, from, from what you can tell? Let, let's start with sort of big Northrop Grumman and then sort of dealing with your different suppliers, knowing that, you know, there's a lot of Northrop Grumman, undoubtedly that's probably at a CMMI level five and 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 certainly uh, or, or somewhere close to that across your ecosystem. So it's, you know, some of that is embedded into your culture, but a lot of it perhaps isn't into your suppliers. I mean, what does that look like? No, it's a, it's a great question, and I'll start by sort of continuing the other conversation. The, the discussions about reciprocity, they're, you know, what's the goal here? The goal here is to actually be more secure, not just to pass an audit. And so we're really in earnest. I think all of us together are trying to get to the point where you don't repeat something, but to the point before, the apple is not the chainsaw, thankfully. 
And you actually don't want to, we don't want to get credit for something we didn't do because then we won't actually be secure. We're trying really hard to get it right. You know, that said, there are so many certifications and audits that a company like Northrop Grumman goes through and all of our, our colleague companies that we want to make sure we get credit for that. And so it really is a hard one. You know, I think for a big company, typically you, you already at, are at these levels uh, in, in the work that you do, but it becomes how does it structure to, uh, you know, as Jeff was saying, how do you prepare for the audit? You know, you, you go to the test with your sharpened pencil in the old days and enough and food. Uh, so you show up to these things on game and it's all about how do you track your suppliers? How have you worked with your internal business units? How do you get your technical people that are running the infrastructure that are developing the software on top of that infrastructure that know where it's all connected that can actually answer the questions that number one back up the great results that you already have, but two have embraced the new culture and can demonstrate that they have. And it's a big lift because companies are not in the you know our business is not in quotes to limited to cybersecurity. Our business is building great things that help our war fighters in our country. But cybersecurity has to be a foundation to make sure that those products for all of us, all of our companies are sound. So when you get back to what, you know, question, what does this look like? It is a massive a process and technological lift to make sure not only company and suppliers all gearing up to get it right, but that it's meaningful. When we say, hey, we got a great score on something, we want that to mean something. We want it to mean we're secure, not just that we mastered the art of an audit. Can I, can I just uh, pop yeah, in here? Yeah, please, because you, you made some good points about sort of the meaningful, the labeling, and I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I, and I think Phyllis is, is basically always spot on. Um, you know, one of the things- that we My mom's paying you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we one of the things that we that we observed when we were looking at this sort of confidence mechanism ecosystem that CMMC certainly falls into is there's so much out there right now to the point that a lot of it becomes borderline meaningless um, and that's a risk and an opportunity for CMMC. Uh, CMMC can go one direction where it's creating new stuff. And it just becomes, I mean, it's it's clearly important for DIB in the defense space, but it, if it's creating new stuff and it's not consolidating or creating reciprocity, it runs the risk of becoming just as irrelevant because there's so much out there already. The, the opportunity there, though, is to look at what's already out there and say, this stuff works. We know this stuff works. We need to consolidate it under one banner, simplify things, and give the companies like Northrop, but also like the smaller companies, an opportunity to have a simpler audit process where they don't have to go through these hundred other certifications. They just need to comply with certain CMMC maturity levels. I think that's incredibly important for the future of CMMC and certification labeling more broadly. Fair enough. Okay, hey, we've got a couple of great questions about the C3 uh, PAO. One of them is, I'll kind of combine them together and uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is gonna be Jeff, you answering this, but anyone can chime in. First, what's the training that's required to become a C3 PAO? And then secondly is um, any idea when approved C3 PAOs will be posted to the AB website? Sure. So there's a couple of categories here. It's important that we all understand that there's, there's two categories, uh, not just C3 PAO. So C3 PAO is one of them but the certified assessor is the other. So in the FedRAMP world, the C3PAO you know, conducts the assessment, but in the CMMC ecosystem, a certified assessor conducts the assessment who is employed by a C3PAO. So it's a little bit of a different model. Um, assessors are trained, instructors are trained, C3PAOs are licensed. So um, in order to be a certified, uh, assessor for CMMC. There's, like I said earlier, there's an evolutionary path because we have to actually create a pipeline of people. Of course, there are some people that are ready to be assessors now, and we actually have 50 assessors uh, currently trained and, and tested right now that have been through the program. Uh, but long term, there will be a, a, a evolutionary path where an assessor will first take a class called the Certified Professional class 
which is a three to four day CMMI, CMMC, sorry, there's a lot of models in my head, CMMC uh, basics and understanding the models and what's different about that and NIST and those types of things, along with hands-on exercises and exams. Then there's a CMMC level one assessor designation, uh, which is a three-day class, a CMMC level three designation, which is an additional class, and a CMMC um, level five designation. Now you can, of course, if you're a level five assessor, you can assess one through five, uh, so it's all cumulative. Um, currently in the field, we have uh, what we're calling provisional assessors, and these are people who will be doing the initial assessments, provide us with retrospectives and lessons learned, and part of that walk run strategy that I described earlier. They have been through a four day class, and they met a very high bar of experience. All of them had demonstrated assessment experience in multiple fields. They had technology experience of greater than 10 years. So the bar was a little bit higher for that initial set precisely because the training was less rigorous than what we're planning long-term. Um, so we currently have 50 have been through that program. Of that 50, about 20 of them have affiliated C3PO applications and we have uh, vetted and been through the first class of C3PAOs and we're getting started on vetting the second. So you should see them up there pretty shortly. That's fantastic. And is that, is this, uh, that, that was a nice nugget there that I think a lot of people are very interested in. And I don't know if that information that you just described there is readily available, sort of that storyline of an, ex an explanation. But if it isn't, I would urge us to, as a community, to post that somewhere. Maybe we can even post this video somewhere so people can get the 101 on that. Got a couple of, well, first of all, let me throw out uh, got a, uh, that poll number three. Uh, where are you in your, uh, your assessment? You preparing for CMM certification? You preparing to conduct assessments? Are you preparing to, uh, to put CMM requirements into contracts? Or are you just looking at developing standards for CMM C3? Want to throw that poll out there while we uh, uh, kick it over to a couple of uh, remaining questions here. We only have a few minutes left, but let me, let me throw one out. You mentioned FedRAMP, and that is something that has come up several times in the various conversations about, uh, you know, no more than we're lighting this up across the DIB. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, is this going to drift its way over into the civilian uh, community? Is that sort of the master plan? Any conversations around that? What's the thought process? Anyone want to chime in on that? I'd be happy to, if you'd like. Um, sure. So NASA and GSA has already reached out trying to find a way to get their contractors under SOUP and other GSA to get ready for the CMMC standard. And we are putting together a, a training program to help them. And this is high level education. This is not the kind of training that Jeff and his colleagues put together for the three POs, but a much more lightweight program to get them aware, prepared, and uh, and how might this might be integrated. The, the real pressure that we're seeing, uh, to be honest with you, is coming out of our European partners. So that, that interest in that community is driving a much larger ecosystem. So when you begin to then take all that in context, you say, okay, what about this cloud security stuff and this FedRAMP? You look at this and you go, okay, that's all well and good, but again, the availability of security controls if you're let's say a high-tech uh, provider uh, of cloud capabilities whether you're an integrator or whether you're a platform provider the fact that you have those controls available doesn't mean that you properly configured and put your data in that system and that you have the expertise to manage that cui and fci data so when you look at something like uh, a very mature banking company like capital one they had all that expertise and they still got breached. So we need to really look at, if we're gonna do this reciprocity and expand into other sectors is, how do we deal with the, the limitations of CMMC that's measuring an important set of factors, 171 factors, how do we extend that? How do we incorporate an extension into the technology domain with monitoring tools, with you know cyber, uh, attack responses and such, because those are part of a larger ecosystem. And that's where we're focused on the COE is, how do we extend this 
how do we look at the entire ecosystem as Robert suggested we do? Interesting uh, and bringing up some very good points. Let me, uh, let me uh, throw it uh, over to Robert to give us a prediction of what you think is gonna happen in regards to, will this make its way over to the civilian market? Then we're gonna throw it over to our poll results and we're gonna wrap it up. I think it's a great question, Luke. And I, I think, you know, I would love if CMMC can become that great consolidator in this space, which I think it can, and I think it should. Uh, I think, you know, it would benefit the entire federal government, frankly, state and local governments, and potentially critical infrastructure providers if it does make its way into the civilian market, uh, into the civilian gov market. Uh, but also, I think, look at sort of how the similar type of model can play an important role in the private sector. Uh, and the way that the private sector, especially our critical infrastructure providers, procure technology, procure contracts, and the like. Listen, I want to thank all of you, Jeff, Phyllis, John, Robert, for your extensive expertise on a very important subject that is evolving before our very eyes. We're going to throw it over to the poll results, of which I think the number one is going to be preparing for CMM certification. And uh, whoa. That is not the case. It looks like looking at or developing CMMC standards rose wow. to the top. All right, with that, we're going to close it out and take a, uh, uh, a nice, uh, uh, what is it, 10 minute break? Is that right? Hey, 15 Luke, thank minute you break. So much. You're, 15 you're minute phenomenal. break. You're a phenomenal uh, panel runner. So thank you so much. Panel <laughs> runner. That's what we do. He's a John. show runner. Yeah. The show runner. Right. Any anytime I can manage chainsaws and apples, you know, that's a good job. Right? <laughs> that, was, that was pretty impressive. All right. Thanks, folks. We're going to take a 15 minute break. Thanks for and having we'll me. You all reset your counters, okay. get some Thank coffee, et cetera. And we're going to be back day, with securing, uh, excuse me, SysQ data protection and DevOps measures. It's going to be awesome. We'll see you soon.